and retire. Uh, this is not an easy decision. Uh, honestly, it's the hardest decision of my life. Uh, but it is the right decision for me. Uh, for the last four years or so, I've been in this cycle of injury, pain, rehab, injury, injury pain, rehab. Uh, and it's been unceasing and relenting, unrelenting, both in season, both in and off season. Uh, and I felt stuck in it, and the only way I see out uh, is, is to, to no longer play football. Uh, it's, it's taken my joy of this game away. Uh, and uh, this. Sorry. I've been stuck in this process. I haven't been able to live the life I want to live. Taking the joy out of this game. And after 2016, where I played in pain and was unable to regularly practice, I made a vow to myself that I would not go down that path again. Welcome in. It's another edition of Doyle and Derek, the podcast, IndyStar, IndyStar.com. I'm Derek Schultz, afternoon host on Fox Sports 1260, but I always introduce Greg Doyle as the star of the show, the columnist from the Indy Star. And Greg, usually when we do this, I shoot you a text, I don't know, like a couple hours prior with a little bit of a, a rundown and an outline of the things that we're going to talk about today. But this is one of those days and really the last 48, 72 hours, you don't need a rundown. You don't need an outline to know what we're going to discuss on, on this episode here. It, it occurred to me as I was driving into the star because we're here in a little lunar module inside the star recording studio. It occurred to me that there's no rundown. <laughs> and then it occurred to me like a half second later, oh, I know why there's no rundown. Yeah. Because it would just say luck. Um, but real quick, before we get to that, before we get to that, you didn't, the first podcast we did, I wore a very beautiful white pineapple shirt. It was a nice pineapple shirt, yeah. Well, last time I wore a blue pineapple shirt, which you didn't notice the pineapples. So I'm wearing it again. As my bosses said, Greg, weren't you wearing that last time? Yeah, I was, yeah. bosses. <laughs> I want Derek to notice, not you. So are you, are you fishing for compliments? Because you look nice in your pineapple shirt. All I'm saying is yeah. that, that pineapples matter Fit you me. well? My favorite fruit is pineapple. Just like my favorite flavor of coffee is mocha. Just two things to know. I love mocha, too. I didn't know you were a coffee guy because I haven't seen you drink coffee. You have no idea how much I love mocha. Yeah. I yeah. would think that anybody that works on deadlines would need lots and lots of coffee. Actually, I need lots and lots of decaf. You know, <laughs> decaf is one quarter. Do you know decaf is one quarter caffeine? Really? No, I, th I thought decaf was exactly what it says it is. So I thought did it was I. no caffeine. So did I. And so huh. I'm the idiot that used to drink decaf coffee in my hotel room after a Colts game late at night. Like, I want to have a little cup of coffee in my M&M's, M &M's, but no, anyway, we can get back to luck, but it's readers, listeners, listen to me. Decaf is a quarter caffeine, so you're screwing yourself if you think it late late at night you can have it because you can't so what did you guys lead the luck retirement podcast with well we talked about how decaffeinated coffee actually does have some caffeine in it that give readers <laughs> zig when they want to zag and pineapples zig when they want to zag pineapple shirts from strip uh thrift stores uh let's let's get right into it greg yes. first your reaction uh when you heard the news 9 30 right around there it's the i believe the third quarter of a meaningless preseason game against the bears you're up in the lucas oil stadium press box tell me what you're thinking right off the bat my first reaction is is horror hor horrified mm -hmm. and i realize that and we'll talk about this more i'm sure people internalize this decision how it affects them um so maybe given that i should actually give people a small pass however m my internalization wasn't to get mad at anybody else it was just oh my god this is the biggest story of the year, and it happened at 9.30, and unlike almost everybody in this press box who's going to have all night, like the guys from The Athletic, I saw text messages, they're leaving the press box at 4 a.m. Because they could write whenever, they, they have no deadline. It's, yeah. My deadline was 11. 9.30, this happens, the game still has to be played, we go downstairs, we talk to Luck, Ballard, Ursa. I literally got up in the middle of the press conference I and left because I didn't have time. I had 25 minutes to write this biggest story. So my, my reaction was selfish and, sh and out of shock. And, uh, but then it was, oh my God, did that, did that just happen? It was like, I, I was driving home. Like, did that really, did Andrew Luck just quit? Did that, did that happen? That's when it really dawned on me. Like that happened. You've been a columnist for a long time. Was this one of the hardest things you've ever had to process and then immediately write about? Because I felt like I was still processing this decision yesterday. And that was 48 hours after the fact. No, this was actually, it was easy. Um, because what I did was I, I described what I saw and gave just enough sentences in there to make it feel clear how I feel about what I saw. But 
Here's here's what it looked like. Like you guys weren't here. I was here. Here's what here's what Chris Ballard looked like. Here's what Frank Reich looked mm-hmm. like. Here's what Andrew Luck sounded like. That was easy. What's hard is a night football game that comes down to the wire, and your deadline's eleven. The game ends at ten forty-five, and you've got to have an opinion on a win or a loss, and you can't write the same thing and put one sentence on the top. I mean, so that's yeah. much harder than this. This was scarier though because this is this will follow. All of us forever. I mean, Google doesn't forget. The Google, well, you can link to this story forever. And if so, it's uh, knowing this is going to get read as widely as it did, it was a little bit intimidating. When you hear everything that he had to say in the press conference, did it kind of surprisingly make uh, maybe not surprisingly, it made sense, didn't it? What Andrew oh. Luck had to say, it's just the shock of the decision is one thing. I, I don't, I don't think that was predictable, but I think what was predictable, what was what. Luck's rationale for walking away was. I think that made sense not only to us in, in this space lunar module here at the Indy Star headquarters, huh. but I think it made sense to Colts fans too once they kind of calmed down and and rationalized everything. Well, I think it made sense to those. I don't know. It made sense to a lot of people in the moment, and it, and it definitely has made sense to some who in the moment were too upset. Hadn't made sense to everybody. I mean, I'm still. I'm oh, still. Some getting, people are still angry. Oh, they're still angry, yeah. and they're and they're. They're sending me emails, not all of them, but a lot of them are sending me emails explaining why we're mad and trying to, because they can tell that I don't like it, and they're trying to justify it. Like, you're, you're making it worse. One guy sent me an email saying, do you understand that the fans weren't, weren't necessarily booing Andrew? They were booing the Colts and being lied to, and this happened right now. And I'm thinking, I, I wrote the guy back. I said, so you guys booed Andrew Luck as a proxy? You ruined I mean, that was a ruining moment for Andrew Luck to be booed off the field. And you thought that was okay because we want the Colts to know we're mad? Like, screw you if that's what you really – I don't believe that. That's just what one guy was saying. So screw you, one guy. You know who you are if you're listening. Um, but anyway, it made a lot of sense that – that that here's what makes sense, okay? Let's get let's get down to brass tacks. This is not a physical decision. This is not about Andrew Luck's body. That, that's not – his body didn't break. Emotionally, he broke. This – the toll – of four years and 2017 being so traumatic. And, and, you know, it's funny. We talk about 20, how bad 2017 was. We kind of gloss over the year that he had a concussion and had his kidney lacerated. We gloss over that. Yeah. One. Oh, yeah. That also happened. That Subluxation is- of his shoulder, cracked ribs. Yeah. It, I mean, <laughs> a kidney. Never that. That's the small thing that happened yeah. to him. But uh, And actually, the, the calf and the ankles is a small thing, too. But it broke him. Like, we all have a stress cup, and it can only hold so much stress. If you think of stress as a liquid, it can only hold so much. And Lux was kind of full. And this latest thing, it it spilled over. It, it was the last straw. It was absolutely. It, it was the last, the last straw. straw. That was it. And and those are his words. And that's what exactly what he said. It, really, the severity of the calf ankle, we might not ever know, but it's irrelevant because he didn't want to put himself through it like he did in 2017. And and I think he reached a point, Greg, where not to sound crass, but it was bleep or get off the pot time. Are you in? Are you going to shoot yourself up with painkillers and play week one in L.A. Or are you out? Are you going to walk away? And he. Clearly chose the latter. There's not a position on the field where you can get away with this, but the last one you can get away with it is quarterback, where if you're not just all in, if you don't have fo- total faith in your body and, and, and the commitment that you want to pour yourself into that position, as Luck said, he would be letting down the team. And granted, Luck at 85% is probably better than Brissett at 100. I mean, I don't mean that as an insult, but it probably is. But it wasn't good enough for Luck. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. So I, I, I get it. And. I, I don't understand. I know, I've seen you on Twitter, and you're, you're. I think you and I come at this from a little bit different because you're, you're, you're trying to empathize. Like I have a lot of empathy for Andrew Luck. I don't have any empathy for the people booed. I don't have any. Like I don't. I believe me. I have empathy that you're upset. I, I get it. You're upset. I'm not saying you, had, you should, you're unhappy. You're upset. You're mad. You feel jilted. I get all of that. What I don't get is letting Andrew Luck know that the way they did because you ruined that kid's night, and he's a great guy. It's the wrong reaction. I think we all agree that booing your own players is the wrong reaction. All I'm saying is that it's – I think there is a raw human element of that being your knee-jerk reaction. Darius Leonard said yesterday that his first reaction when he was asked about, hey, Andrew Luck is retiring, he said, selfishly, I was upset. Hey. I, I think I think it's okay in the moment when you find out in the third quarter of a preseason game from a dude in front of you who's sitting in the stands who happens to check his phone during kiss cam that your franchise player is retiring, I think the first reaction being frustration or even anger, 
justified isn't the right word, Greg. I, I just, I get it. I wouldn't have booed personally. I, I don't think you should ever boo your own player. And I get that it overshadowed what should have been a nice send-off for Andrew Luck. But I, I think when you add up the context, uh, the, the distrust that many fans have had with the Colts organization on how these things have been handled, it made sense to me that that was the initial reaction. I think rational fans, yes, you're still getting emails. I'm getting emails and tweets from irrational fans who are still angry. I think most rational fans understand, hey, that wasn't the right reaction, and they appreciate what Andrew Luck put his body through. But in the heat of the moment, when you find out that you're ripping the Band-Aid off and you, and you get broken up with via text message, basically, I can understand that human reaction. Well, as I said, I understand the emotions there. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um but I, I don't I don't get like there's Malcolm Gladwell has blink theory, you know, and, you know, your first reaction and in his opinion, your first reaction is what you really think. Well, the way my interpretation of that as it relates to this is is what you do, your first reaction. That's who you are. And so I don't give a free pass to the booing as it's it's OK. Um, I mean, I, the people that have said they, they feel bad about it and apologize. I love that because Lord knows I've done a lot of things in the heat of the moment. That yeah, were, we all have. They were wrong. Yeah. Right. So I'm not I'm not holier than anybody. But I did. But I but that's what you did. And it's not OK. And it's not OK. That it was your first reaction was to do that. Um, yeah. I don't get I don't get if you have now that we're starting to kind of add. Oh, the. the the pieces together. Sorry, go ahead, Greg. What did you I want just, to say? I, I've already forgotten this twice. I just want to say this really quick. So, if, you know, hopefully, because because the people that think they're still right, you can't get through to them. And maybe this will help. I have no idea. But if someone on the street in the car, someone cuts you off, they do this, they do whatever, and you, it's okay to be furious and, and all this. What's not okay is to punch them in the face. Like you can be mad. No, it's actually a good analogy. Yeah, yeah you, I, I agree with you. Or someone someone bumps into you at the mall. Um, you can be upset at them, and you can wish they hadn't done that, and you can maybe even go tell somebody, mm -hmm. a cop or whatever. What you can't do is take it into your own hands and punch them in the face. You can't do it. It's not okay. It's kind of like the old write a letter and then stick it in a drawer and wait 20 minutes. You know, that whole thing where you, you, you're you angry and you write it down, and then you never end up actually giving the person that letter. I swear Twitter's made it worse. I swear. No, because, 100%. And, and, and Twitter, and, and I'm not – I'm sort of blaming Twitter for the booing only in the sense that it's muscle memory. We have muscle memory of, I have a thought, I'm going to share that thought. It used to be I have a thought, and I'm not going to see the guy I'm mad at for three hours. I'm going to share it. And three hours later, you don't say it to him. No. But I have a thought, and on Twitter, I'm going to tweet the guy right now. Well, I, I, we're, people are conditioned to have a thought and to express it right then. And it's just... And there's pressure. There's outside pressure. You're the calmness for the Indianapolis Star. You're paid to have a take. Give me your take right now. This just happened. Give me your take right now, right? I mean, people oh, yeah. are expecting you to react in the moment, and I think, you know, sometimes you, all of us do that where we succumb to the pressure. What I was going to say was the the timeline, the details of the timeline are starting to come together now with when the Colts knew this was going to happen, when Luck knew this was going to happen, and they reached a financial settlement reportedly last weekend. So my question is, Greg, did they really think they could sit on this for seven days and that it wasn't going to leak out? Hell, they almost made it to the finish line, I guess. Why did they wait a week? Why, why, did, why didn't the Colts and Andrew Luck, once they knew he was retiring, call a press conference the next day? My impression and understanding of all this is they reached a settlement almost as a contingency plan, but I don't think, like, I don't think Reich and Ballard, I could be wrong, I, I, I got the impression they found out a couple days beforehand. Just like Luck told Brissett a couple days before. But even if you found out a couple days beforehand, right? That, that has to you have to get that press conference going like now. Well, here's the thing: um, Andrew Luck has called every shot. You're right, including 2017. I mean, he called every shot in 2017. He called every shot now, and and so I don't know, but I have to assume that Andrew Luck didn't want because you know the way he's thinking probably is if I have this press conference before the game, it'll overshadow the game, and I don't want to do that. So let's let's have it the next day. I'm guessing that's what he thought. I'm also guessing that because he he held on. People think, oh, he he's known for weeks or months. No, he hasn't. Maybe he knew for a week, but I think he was holding on to hope that this is going to be okay. I'm going to wake up one day and my ankle's going to feel good. And I think I think you know Thursday, Friday, Saturday rolled around and he he told the guys, okay, it's over. So yeah, the Colts they gambled and get and guessed wrong. But I don't think the Colts leaked it. So people are mad. No, like, there's no way. Yeah. Nobody the Colts leaked this. And it was such a small circle of people that knew that. Um, you know, I, I don't think why, why would you know some people are saying well Ursay leaked it because he was angry. No. Jim Ursay would never do something like that. He would never be spiteful. Hell, he gave him twenty five million dollars as a parting gift. Yeah, and I I've got a story coming up. I, it, it might be you know released while we're talking. So by the time this thing goes online, it'll be up. Um, about 
the conspiracy theory that Ursay and the Colts lied in 17 and, and perhaps lied again now to sell tickets. It's it, like so many conspiracy theories, like John Dillinger is not in that grave. Like so many conspiracy theories, there's just enough there that if you don't actually think too much about it, you could believe it. And it's mm-hmm. fun. And, yeah. and conspiracy theories are cotton candy. They are fun. <laughs> but, it, but you know, you got to think. And here's the thing. And, and you got to know stuff. People don't know this. Hell, I didn't know this until today. I looked this up. The, uh, the, the revenue streams NFL teams have, tickets are a, a portion, not even half. TV money is the biggest revenue stream yeah. by far. There's also, t- there's also tickets, yes, but there's, there's license and apparel. And, I mean, there's all streaming and, and gambling and, and jersey sales. and I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. And the profit margin, get this, here's the thing. The profit margin on the tickets they sell, they make 8%. They make 8%. Jeez. And they're going to sell about thirty or 40,000 tickets, whether luck plays or not. But are they going to sell 10,000 more with luck? Maybe. So they're, they're gambling everything and, and, and robbing from people around here for an 8% profit on 10,000 tickets? When Jim Mercer has a million dollars to buy a guitar? That is, I mean, he's a billionaire. That is, and they just gave Luck twenty five million. It's insane. So and, you gave Luck twenty five million to sell more season tickets well, and the delay conspir- the right. The conspiracy theory, it right, makes sense. Right. The conspiracy theory is that yeah, they gave him twenty five million for his silence and for appreciation. <laughs> yeah, you didn't ma- you didn't make twenty five million profit in the extra tickets he sold. No, you lost money in the exchange. Yeah, if that's true, and it's not true, people, it's not true. I don't care what radio host says, it's true. It ain't true. <laughs> All of that said, though, Greg. The Colts have a perception problem. You know, it, I agree with you that it's not true. These conspiracy theorists, uh, they are ridiculous. But clearly, multiple fans think this, right? Don't you have a problem with your organization when fans feel like they've been misled and and there is a distrust between your paying customers and you and you're trying to sell a product? That is a problem. Now, the, we are in a day and age of deniers, and so it's this is like they're these are like I guess injury deniers or truth deniers. Are they I don't believe that they didn't know, so I'm denying what they're saying. Yeah, there's and I don't want to start listing the other more famous deniers that we have because I don't want to <laughs> equate this to anything else out there. But that's what we do in this day and age is that, is that a handful of people decide they're smarter than everybody else, and while we all know one thing, a handful knows something. Else. They know the real story. And that's just the way it is. And it's, it, but it doesn't mean I got to listen to it. It doesn't mean I got to respect it. And having said all of that, I agree with you that because of the way 17 went down, I mean, Jim Mercy was just wrong in 17, but that, that has hurt them terribly. Yeah. Um, and that, up to a point, that's Ursay's fault. But we need to understand why Ursay was so wrong. He wasn't lying to us, he was wrong. Ursay's a fan. When you're a fan, you say, IU is going to beat Purdue because this, 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 and you actually believe it's true. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow when IU loses to Purdue, did you lie? You just didn't know. Mm-hmm. You didn't know. Uh, a forecaster tells us it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Leave your umbrella at home, and it rains. Did the guy lie about it? He didn't know. Ursay didn't lie about luck. He thought what he hoped and was wrong. Where it jumps off the track a little bit is he's the guy that stands to make a li- little bit of money on ticket sales if he is wrong. But again, the profit margin is so small, it's nonsense. It's still to think that we went from a calf strain five months ago to right. the, the career being over. It, it just really is a lot to process. And when Luck says, I, I don't remember what the exact question was at the press conference, but something about when did you first start thinking about this? And he, he said it was a one to two week timetable. That's where I really struggle. Um, do, I, do I believe that Andrew Luck didn't finally decide to retire until the past two weeks? Yeah, okay. But the fact that retirement must have crept into his mind at some point over the last four or five months beforehand because I, I just don't think this is a decision. You don't make a decision of this magnitude in 10 to 14 days. If I had to guess, if I had to guess, the, the, the moment it crept into his head is you remember he, he training camp he played yeah. for a couple, three days, did, did you know personal drills, whatever. And then they shut him down because he had pain in his ankle, mm-hmm. and they couldn't find it. My guess is I don't know how many weeks that was. My guess is that that's the first time he said, "I can't do this anymore." That's probably when it was. And we were wrong, but boy, I mean, I was wrong. Uh, Luck had a smile on his face, was giggling and laughing and happy before the Cleveland Browns exhibition. He had he had that pregame workout that had the Twitter going nuts. Yeah, we we're all what, talking about what, it. what was that? Did you hear him in the press conference after he was asked about? It that. almost like he he wanted to touch the field for the last time and throw a football at Lucas Oil Stadium? That that's weird, but he he said I was I was saying goodbye almost. 
to me, Greg, look, I respect Andrew Luck's decision and all of that. To me, it's it's almost insulting that Luck went out there and did that dog and pony show because it baited us. Even this podcast, we were sitting in this booth last week. You and I both thought, hey, he had a smile on his face, looked pretty good. I think he's going to play week one. I, I think whether it was his intention or not, I think he fooled people into thinking that, hey, it was all systems go. You know what? I hadn't thought about it like that, but you're right. That if if he really, if that's really what he thought, that I I'm I'm at peace because I think I'm saying goodbye. That was a cold, especially if you don't retire like that. Announce it that night or something. But yeah, you want to throw a football, fine, but the whole like high step stuff and and all of that to kind of show off. Hey, I'm going side to side. I mean, come on, man. Well, yeah. What what was that? That's you know what I just like I tell people think think about this think about this. If you think about what you're saying, Derek, it's it's hard to say you're wrong. <laughs> that it's really, and I'm not, I'm not, and I love Andrew, and I, I, but I don't know what what was going through his head on that one. Let's talk legacy wise, which is still difficult to do, even though we're three days removed, because it, it, it's just so hard, Greg, to think that Andrew Luck has done everything that he's going to do on a football field. It's over, right? There was always that promise of of what was to come, and now to to kind of contemplate that this is all done. But you wrote about it in the Star. You can't separate the exit from the legacy, right? It, it's going to overshadow, and in some people's eyes, in a negative way, what Luck's ultimate legacy was. The exit is the legacy, because, and I, and I, people again, everybody wants to be smart than everybody else, and and I'm not sure I'm right about this, but I, this is the most shocking retirement in NFL history. I believe that, and here's why: Jim Brown, yeah, Jim Brown. Better players, Jim Brown, yeah. Calvin Johnson, yeah, probably. Barry Sanders, definitely. Better players, for sure. They were all, they had all reached the apex of their career. Mm-hmm. One of them won a Super Bowl. The other two, Sanders and Calvin Johnson, if you look at their stats, they were still great. But their best years were a year or two or more behind them. All of them. Andrew Luck's best years were ahead of him. The Colts' best years were ahead of him. Luck's best years were ahead of him. The timing of it happening two, day, two weeks before. There, nothing, we've never seen anything like this. So that is his legacy, is what he left on the table. Not the years he gave Indy, but the years that he left on the table. That is it. You think most people in Indianapolis will have a positive viewpoint of Luck's career 10, 15, 20 years from now? Oh, oh, of his career? No. Um, of Andrew Luck? Yes. I don't, And I think most people right now are not too terribly down on him. But, I mean, he's not going to be around – now, listen, nationally and, and beyond maybe, um, this is not going to go over well long term people are going to always wonder how could he do that and even around here we're going to wonder how could he do that i guess but but no no one's going to remember these years and go i'm good you know good in fact if anything i think people are going to say was was it the right decision to keep luck and not peyton manning um and i'm not i don't think i I think they did the right thing i think six seven years with luck is better than than the you don't know with peyton with the information you had at the time it was the right decision i'll I'll continue to defend that yeah, yeah peyton's age with the come off neck surgery you don't say, yeah, I'm going to – no. We didn't know how good he'd be in Denver. Nobody could have mm-hmm. known that. And an MVP season, what was it, 55 touchdowns in 2013? It's it's really cr- kind of crazy what he did. I, I do think that there is a certain level of frustration and anger attached to the Luck era that has nothing to do with Luck but has to do with the franchise, with Ryan Grigson, with Chuck Pagano, and how the Luck era was managed. Mismanaged. That's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was that – and as I mentioned earlier, he had a stress cup, and it was full, Yep. and he couldn't take this. And a lot of the reason the stress cup was full is because of what happened, uh, the beating he took. However, the the two biggest things he went through, the shoulder and the calf, none of that, none of that has to do with Grigson. None of it. Now, the, the kidney, I mean, we can blame that on Grigson. We can also say it happened in football. But, he, you know, you get hit that much, the odds are you're going to get hurt pretty badly. But, but as you recall, the kidney shot was a shot eight yards downfield. So, I mean, if you really want to be fair, and I've never been a Grigson, I'm not a Grigson guy. I was hard. I was, I think I was the first guy really hard. I came into town in 2014, just started ripping them right away. Like I, I knew what the Colts' record was, but the the players in the field, like they're not any good. Mm-hmm. And the Colts fans didn't like me for that, but I, I stand by what I wrote five years ago. Anyway, Grigson's failings didn't shred his shoulder. Grigson's failings have nothing to do with this calf. So yes, Grigson sucked. Yes, Pagano didn't help things. Yes, Chud was terrible. Um, that's not why Andrew Luck is retired. I do wonder, when you go back to 2016, Grigson and Pagano uh, come back. Remember the awkward press conference with oh, Ursay? Yeah. They're tied at the hip. Yeah. 
And I do wonder, him playing through the shoulder, the torn shoulder, look, it's Andrew Luck's decision. Andrew Luck should have shut it down. He decided not to shut it down. I do wonder how much of that was based on the context of what was happening where you had a coach and a general manager whose jobs were on the line. And did he feel like he had to be out there and play through that? Because wouldn't you agree playing through the shoulder tear in 16 is what really kind of screwed things up for him in 17 and beyond? I would, but... I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm assuming that didn't help. It couldn't have helped. It, couldn't, it had to have hurt. Um, granted, he was a year older in 17 and three years older now than in 16. But Andrew Luck is one of those old souls. I mean, he was... At 20, he was 40, you know, yeah. emotionally. I mean, so... I don't we've what we've seen from Andrew Luck in the last three years is he doesn't care about that. He's calling the shots. Mm -hmm. And we we know that he wants to play from he wants to play for the team, but do I think for a minute that he played that season, even as a small factor, was Ursay brought back Pagano and Grigson, I owe it to everybody to give this a shot myself? No. He owed it to his teammates to give them a shot, I believe. He owed it to he wanted to play for himself, but do I think that that, that press conference and the and the, the odd marriage is why Luck played through a not, not even not even 5% chance. Let's talk about where the Colts are today because that's kind of getting lost in all of this, right? We're, we've been talk, talking about the fallout of the Luck surprise retirement and you forget that a season's going to happen in whatever, 11 or 12 days. Um, seems to me that the locker room can move on from this pretty quickly, but it was interesting to kind of add up all the, the reactions from teammates and kind of get their take on what was going on. Well, just like Ursay three years ago, two years ago, said what he – he believed what he hoped. The same thing's happening in that locker room. They really hope they're going to be okay, and so they talk like they believe it. And I will say that if you're going to have all 32 NFL teams and say, you know, two weeks ago, of these 32 teams, let's rank them in order of who could handle losing their quarterback today best. I put the Colts first. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're going to go same record with Brissett as luck. That's not what I'm saying. Everybody's going to take a step back. The question is, how big a step back do you take? Two, three years ago, the step back was to 4-12. and 12. With the same quarterback, yeah, but he was, he'd was have been in town eight days. He didn't even know anybody's name, much less the plays. He's better, knows the system. The coach is better. Frank, they've got one of the best offensive coaches in football. They've got the best offensive line, one of the best offensive lines. Their receivers are so much better. Ballard's put a deeper roster around everybody. And Jacoby Brissett, there must be eight teams in, this, in the league, we could probably count six or eight, that have quarterbacks that shouldn't be starting, but you don't have a choice. That's what you got. There might be one backup in the whole league last year that you probably should be starting somewhere, one, and he's the guy that's going to start for the Colts next. There's actually, am I right in saying, Greg, there's no excuse for Jacoby Brissett not to succeed. I'm not, I'm not saying that he has to be an all-pro or a pro bowler. There's no excuse for him not to succeed. He's been in the system for a couple of years. He's taken all the first-team reps this entire training camp and preseason. Uh, he's loved in that locker room. He has a, a great head coach. He has a very good general manager with what they've done so far, albeit with a limited sample size. They've got a loaded roster. To me, Brissett in 2017 was on an ultimate free pass because it was an impossible situation. Like you said, I think you have to just throw 2017 right out the window. It's a completely different context to this. But I don't think there's any reason why, at least individually, I don't know if the team is going to have a lot of success, but I don't think there's any reason why individually Jacoby Brissett shouldn't be a success. They were 4-12 um, and were four and 12 in 17, and that wasn't because of Brissett. Brissett, I mean, look, look who he was throwing to. His top three receivers were T.Y. Hilton – great number two was Dante Moncrief who was ne <laughs> never any good yeah. and number three was Chester Rogers look at the roster now Chester Rogers is their fifth or sixth receiver mm -hmm. and on this team probably only because he's the punt returner but they've got T.Y.'s back and just as good as ever but then now they've got Funches, Paris Campbell um I'm leaving out somebody really look old. at what Deion Kane look at what they've Deion got at, at tight end Oh, and Ebron is on this team. And, and Doyle and the whole deal. And I mean, again, he threw for 3,000 yards without those guys. Yeah. What's he going to do And without an offensive line? So, yes, I agree with you. There's He needs to be very good. He needs to be very good. It's put up, you know, you know poop or get off the pot. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, <laughs> it's that for Jacoby, but I think he's he's – I think he's going to poop. It is good. It, well, that's okay. We'll, we'll put that actually as the preview for the podcast. Oh, great. Greg Doyle says that Jacoby Brissett's going to poop and, and everything's going to be fine. But that's a compliment, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is a compliment. In this context. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that it help, It helps, too, that he's so liked in that locker room. I, I just think, especially for the quarterback position, you really have – you have to have guys want to go to war for you, if yeah. you will. And right. I, I think they're going to want to do that for Brissett. But it's funny, Greg, because Boward and Wright can say – 
hey, Brissett's a top 20 quarterback, and they never actually have to show whether he's a top 20 quarterback. And now it's easy to say, now you've got to show it. Right. But Reich and Sirianni, but especially Reich, you know, it's his offense. Sirianni, I'm sure, is very, very good, but Reich is the guy. They've got the right guy in charge as well. Mm -hmm. And even right down to the point of he was a backup behind a great player and every now and then had to play, shockingly had to play when he didn't think he'd have to. And, I mean, everything is in place, starting with Frank Reich, that that Jacoby can get this done. And that does not mean get it done at the same level as Luck was going to get it done. But, you know, I was 12-4, and 13-3 with Luck. I I could have been wrong, but that's what I thought this team could and maybe should do based on – I didn't love what I saw in the preseason, but based on last year and who came back, and continuity, I thought 12 and 4, 13 and 3 made sense. With Jacoby, it doesn't make sense. But the more I think about it, my first thought was 7 and 9. The more I think about it, I'm thinking 9 and 7 is kind of where I put the over under. That might be good enough to win this division. Yeah. I- I'm serious. I mean, 9 and 7, oh, usually, yeah. usually 10 wins is the minimum for winning an NFL division, but I think 9 and 7 might be good enough, especially considering that the Colts have to play the same divisions and schedule that everybody else has to play. I mean, everybody else has to play the NFC South, too. Right. It, it's not an easy schedule. Everyone else has to play the Chiefs and Chargers. Yeah, so, they're, they're, not an easy schedule for the Colts or for the Texans, Titans, or Jags. Their biggest threat, and the Jags with a new quarterback, maybe that works out for everybody, but their biggest threat is the Texans, who just lost Lamar Miller. Mm-hmm. Granted, losing luck is a much bigger deal. But they did lose their star running back. So... And that was their biggest threat. So they're coming. The Texans, whatever they were going to be, they're a little bit less. The Colts, whatever they're going to be, are a lot less. But I think still nine wins is on the table. What I worry about is, and I'm, I can't back off of this now because I want to be optimistic. When we had a discussion, you and I, and also Jake on on the afternoon show about when we were talking about luck. Let's say worst case scenario, he misses this season because originally we thought worst case scenario, he goes on IR or something. We didn't, never thought retirement was on the table for him. What would their record be with Jacoby Brissett? I think I said six and ten, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, and and what concerns me is the opposing quarterbacks because so much of yes, we can get in you know X's and O's and all of that. I, I understand there are other elements to football besides quarterback play, but the Colts had a decided advantage in a lot of matchups whenever they took the field with Andrew Luck. And now you're not going to have that advantage when you're facing Patrick Mahomes and Drew Brees and Cam Newton and Matt Ryan and. Philip Rivers and Ben Roethlisberger and all of these opposing quarterbacks that they have to face. It's not Cody Kessler, Derek Anderson, Blaine Gabbert, and some of the, you know, Eli Manning and some of the quarterbacks that they faced last year. It's just, it's a whole different set. Of the guys you mentioned, the only guy that I would say the Colts have a clear advantage over would have been Cam Newton and perhaps Roethlisberger at his age. But the other guys you mentioned, they they were an advantage over Luck anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, Luck was very, very good. Um, And granted, the gap even if Mahomes and Breeze and those guys, Rivers, are better than Luck on paper, and they are, they're a lot better than Brissett. So your, your point is taken. They're still taking a the- – What I'm trying to say is you have to score a ton of points to beat offenses led by quarterbacks like right. that. Right. And, and, yeah, 16 points can get you by Alex Smith and the Redskins, uh, but it's not going to work against Drew Brees and Patrick Mahomes. you got to get up into the 30 range to have a chance. I don't, bright, I don't care how good your defense is. On the bright side in this division, they're, they've got – with Jacoby, they still could be better than Jacksonville and Tennessee at quarterback. Mm-hmm. They could be. Not Houston, but they could be second out of four. And if the surrounding cast is better, then and, then so be it. But also those those guys, Jacksonville and Tennessee, they're playing Mahomes and, and Breeze. And yep. they're, they're playing a lot of these guys, too. Yeah, the only two games that are different, I guess, would be uh, the Colts would get Pittsburgh from the north and – it's it's Miami, I think, from the east, right? Because no the the same it's it's the same finish. You play the two you play the six against your own division, four from an NFC division, four from an AFC division, and then two that you finished with. And I, I think that that those are the two games. So Texans won the division, so they'll get New England, and then whoever won the North last year, which I guess was Baltimore. So I guess the, you could look at Houston's schedule and be like, damn, you get Baltimore and New England, right? And all those other games. That's going to be really, really tough. Um, so I'm just fascinated, Greg. I mean, I'm always there's always a level of intrigue whenever you start a new season and, and you get excited. Even though we're not fans, I still get excited to see how things play out. We have takes in the preseason, and you see if you're right or if you're horribly, horribly wrong. I just think that this is one of the most fascinating seasons in Colts history, don't you? Oh yeah, there's no way to know because the, the the variance is so great. You know, four and twelve is what they were with Brissett, so that that's I guess the baseline and. And eleven and five and is what they've been with luck, and that maybe that's the max. So I mean, anything in that range. Who the hell mm-hmm. knows? I mean, what if Percent throws for four thousand yards? What if he does? What if Paris Campbell and Deion Kane are stars? 
we don't know. It's not all about Brissett. What if the you know what if the offensive line is is actually better than last year? It hadn't looked that way so far, but you know it should be with continuity. We just don't know. At the, by the same token, what if guys fall off a cliff? We yep. don't know that either. No, you're right. A lot of unknown, but there's a lot of excitement there. Uh, the columns, you could check out Lux Retirement and all of that. Greg reacting, really everybody here at the Star reacting to what has been uh, just a crazy last 48 to 72 hours. And I promise we'll, we'll move on to other things. I feel bad this was going to kind of be last week where we finally started to get into some college football preview stuff because IU and Purdue and everybody <laughs> opens up, but... I, I don't know what you say when this Lux story is still dominating the national headlines. You got to stick with it. You got to, and, I, and and there's all kinds of angles. And one is, and I, I, it'll be in the paper. Uh, well, go online tomorrow, Wednesday. Chad Kelly. It's all, mm-hmm. And and I hated when he came here. I hated it. And I wrote that I hate it. And I'm not quite sure I hate it so much after watching That's the play. That's your QB too, I think. Uh, right? Yeah, yes, it is. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Greg. We'll do it again next week, buddy. Good, Derek. Yep, Thanks bye. for tuning in, guys.